Hello YouTube and welcome back to the HQ. Today we're going to do, as voted, the, the popular vote, the electoral vote, decided on some mid-season awards. Mid-season fantasy awards. We're going to look at the guys who have likely put you in a position to be undefeated. 7-1, 6-2, or if you're horrible at drafting, maybe you grab one or two of these guys and your team's still trash. Either way, they'd be really, really, really trash without some of these dudes. So we're going to look at the MVPs so far. We're going to look at the top waiver wire pickups. We're going to look at some of the busts, the worst picks of the draft thus far. Second half of the season predictions. Halfway through the season, right? Week 8 is in the books. 16 weeks in fantasy football season. So mid-season MVP awards, some other awards, whatever, whatever, whatever and second half predictions. That's what we're getting into today. Thank you for joining us on the channel. Hit that thumbs up button, like, subscribe, all that kind of stuff. If you are down with BDGE, let's get it. Also want to give a quick shout out to my mans. Sam, the creative director, has launched his own apparel brand, Occur, O-C-C-V-R. He designed these and he has his new line of apparel dropping. Actually, they drew, I think they might have sold out their pre-sale already, but they do have some left if you're looking to buy some, some hoodies. I believe they have long sleeve shirts as well. So he just dropped his new line of apparel. Pretty dope designs, actually, and I'm not getting any kickback on this. He's just a friend of mine who does good work. So if you are interested in checking out some of the sweatshirts, some of the, the hoodies, clothes that he has, I will link his Instagram as well as the website where you could check those out down below. But let's get into it. And for starting off with the quarterback position, of course, we are going to start with none other than Patrick Mahomes. He's on a historic pace, right? And I, I think um, someone's going to have to fact check this on me, but I look back at my numbers and he's averaging... 27.9 fantasy points per game as a quarterback in like regular four point per passing touchdown leagues, 25 yards per point. And that I believe will be the single highest fantasy football season of all time, scoring wise. Um, I could be wrong on that, but I, I don't, I don't think I'm wrong. I think that is a big fact here. And it's crazy because, you know, I always talk about like late quarterbacks, uh, drafting quarterbacks late because none of them are that valuable compared to, relatively speaking, to other quarterbacks. But, like, Patrick Mahomes has made me look at things differently. Now, I will absolutely not, he's not, in a one-quarterback league, I'm still not touching him outside, inside of the first three rounds, probably. Um, I would start looking at him as early as the fourth round. The reason is, and I tweeted this yesterday, I don't have the exact stat up, but the RB1 right now, Patrick Mahomes, or the quarterback one right now, Patrick Mahomes, is averaging 27.9 points a game. The quarterback 15 is averaging over 20 points per game. So it's like a seven to eight point difference on a points per game basis. When you look at the running back one, Gurley is averaging like 27.5 points per game. The running back 15 is averaging like 13 points a game. So that's the reason why quarterbacks are so devalued. One, you only need to start one, so there's always a lot of them on the waiver wire. Two, it's because the point differential between quarterback one and quarterback 15 is seven, when the point differential between running back one and running back 15 is like 15 points. You know what I mean? So that's why you don't take guys like Patrick Mahomes, even you know being how good he is uh, ahead of running backs and things like that. That being said, though, Patrick Mahomes is on pace for a ridiculously good season, right? He's halfway through the year, 2,500, 26 passing yards, 26 touchdowns, six interceptions, 119 rushing yards, two touchdowns. So he's on pace to go for over 5,000 passing yards and 52 passing touchdowns, four rushing touchdowns. Ridiculous. You know what's funny? Like, I was thinking, like, who would you take over Patrick Mahomes in a Superflex League? So if you're redoing a uh, Superflex League, Say you started over in August knowing what we know now, of course, like I just did with the, uh, the, the mock draft that I did on Thursday. If you missed that video, we pretended like we, re we rewinded, we went bike to August and redrafted the first round of a fantasy football draft. If you missed that, I will link it up here. I'm wondering if you're in a super flex league, where would you take Mahomes now? I, I would think Aaron Rodgers was a very popular uh, first round pick in super flex leagues this year. I, I saw him go usually between the eight and 10 spot. So if Aaron Rodgers was going there. I would assume Patrick Mahomes will probably be a top five pick next year in Superflex Leagues. Pro maybe around the same spot that Aaron Rodgers was, but I can't fault someone for doing that. And I know Aaron Rodgers was up there because of the consistency that he's shown year over year, but like the upside of Mahomes, you, you have to think that he's arguably one of the most valuable players in a Superflex League. And I have him in the E-Town Get Down League, thank God. It's funny because he kind of fell into my lap um, because this next guy up on this list, this is the only other quarterback that I actually put 
as as a quarterback kind of MVP. And I might be biased because I own these are my two starting quarterbacks in the Town Get Down League. But it's Patrick Mahomes and it is Andrew Luck. Now Andrew Luck is actually quarterback six on a points per game basis, but I just think the way that he's been playing lately, right? He has actually three fewer passing touchdowns than Patrick Mahomes. He has 23 passing touchdowns through eight games, which is almost three passing touchdowns a game. His uh, 22 point, let me see, 22 fantasy points per game would have, I'm going to see where that would have put him last year. So he's at 22 points a game right now. QB1 last year, Russell Wilson was at 22.2 points per game. So Andrew Luck would have been the quarterback two in fantasy last year had he been putting up the numbers that he is this year, which is pretty crazy. And I think Luck's someone that probably kind of fell far in drafts because people were weary about him. And it was a little nerve wracking when he started off the season. Didn't know what was going on with the shoulder. He didn't look great. He wasn't attempting any deep passes. And all of his weapons started getting injured. But he has overcome everything. And a big part of that is because of the offensive line, man, and how much better they have been this year than they had been in previous years that Luck was the quarterback there. And I think we just saw um, Quentin Nelson, the, their first round pick, their sixth overall pick, just won the player of the month and that was the first time in the history of the NFL that an offensive lineman had won that award so it just you know it, it goes to show you like what luck could have could have done with a good line all these years and um, through eight games he's on pace for nearly 4,400 passing yards 46 passing touchdowns eight interceptions and the crazy part is like luck's a guy that usually got his legs involved in his fantasy scoring and right now he's only got 63 rushing yards through the eight games so um, I think there's a little bit of room for improvement there over the second half of the year, which is crazy. So those are the only two quarterbacks I really have as like league winning quarterbacks right now, or uh, you know guys that I would almost consider MVPs just based on where you draft them. Oh, and I have the ADPs and their overall where they were drafted listed here as well. So Patrick Mahomes in the summer. So I have them from the four for four ADP page where they combine CBS draft, ESPN, FFPC, MFL 10, NFL, Yahoo. Uh, ADPs over the summer, and they tell you where p players were drafted. So Patrick Mahomes was the 115th player off the board, quarterback 16. And of course, he's quarterback one right now. Andrew Luck was 90th overall, quarterback nine off the board. Um, so he is also outdoing his ADP. So those are the quarterbacks I had on here. Wide receivers, obviously, Adam Thielen is by far and away the most valuable wide receiver uh, in fantasy leagues this year based on where he was drafted. Of course, Antonio Brown's doing his thing. D-Hop looks good. Like, a lot of players are doing well. However, Adam Thielen is, you know, if you drafted him, there's a very, very, very good chance you're in at least second place, probably first place in your league. He was pick 30 overall this summer, wide receiver 13. Of course, he was he's wide receiver one right now. Nothing really to say here. I talked about it a lot in my first round mock draft on Thursday. Uh, he was a third or fourth round pick that's giving you elite wide receiver one numbers, eight straight games of 100 yards, and uh, he's clearly the favorite target to Cousins. But it's crazy because Stefan Diggs is also on pace for 170 targets and has 25% of the target share. So it's just a combination of both of those guys being the key players in this offense. But Thielen is clearly, you know, taking no, no days off over here. Hashtag very, very, very good at football. So Adam Thielen is the first wide receiver I would put as like an MVP this year. The second guy I have is Emmanuel Sanders, wide receiver of the Denver Broncos. He was 70th off the board, wide receiver 29. This is one of the guys I definitely hit on. I was, you know, he, I was very, very, very high on him all summer. Um, unfortunately, I only own him, I think, in two of my redraft leagues, which kind of sucks. But he is currently wide receiver 12 right now. So huge return on investment there. He's eighth in receptions. He is 11th in receiving yards. He has had half of his game so far. Four of his eight games have gone for 20 or more PPR fantasy points. Um, this previous week, week eight, was his worst statistical game of the season. Four for 57. So the worst game of the season, he basically gave you 10 PPR fantasy points. And looking forward, now that Demarius Thomas is out of the way, there goes, you know, 19% of the targets, which could probably only mean good things for Sanders. Obviously, it's an increase for Cortland Sutton going forward. But I think Sanders is someone who, if you have in your lineup, you were able to get him in like the 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th round. And he's absolutely killing it for you as a low-end wide receiver one. So I would definitely consider Sanders there. Um, in both of the leagues that I own him in, I'm doing very well. And so Sanders, big MVP. I couldn't really think of any other wide receivers in terms of, you know, there are obviously wide receivers that are producing well. Like I, I was thinking about doing Devontae Adams here, but it's not like he, he was picked in like the top 12, top 14 pick in most drafts. So um, he's kind of performing as you thought he would. So I, I would slightly put Devontae Adams here and... I was looking at maybe the Rams wide receivers, mostly Robert Woods, because he's been so consistent. Like I took Robert Woods 
in, I think, the 13th round of, of the E-Town Get Down, which means he's a keeper option for next year. I'm going to have a tough a tough uh, choice for a keeper option next year because I have Kerryon Johnson, Aaron Jones, Robert Woods. I think they were my 10th, 13th, and 14th round picks this year. And anyone picked in the 10th round or later can be kept the following year, but we can only keep one guy. So, I mean, obviously there's a lot of season left to play, so we'll have to see how it turns out. But those look like three very, very, very solid options going forward. Yeah, I, I would put Robert Woods in there because you get you got him very, very late. And a lot of people are off on him because, you know, obviously... They, they just, they just, a, a lot of people very much like the Lions situation prior to the Tate trade, people are, are kind of shying away from the fact that there are three really studly weapons on that team on, on the outside between Cooper Cup, Robert Woods, and Brandon Cooks. And that was the reason you saw all three of the guys dropped off. And that was a reason I was, you know, lower on Brandon Cooks uh, than the rest, the, than the other two, because I was like, I'm just going to take the cheapest guy out of these three because they're all going to put up probably around similar numbers. And they pretty much have so far. I think Woods has been the best player. Woods has looked like. He's made one of these like Devontae Adams leaps where when you watch him play, man, he looks so damn fast. He looks really good, crisp route running and stuff like that. He looks like he's really developed into a, a really, really, really nice player. So I would say one of the key lessons to take away here is regardless of how bad a player is on the Bills, there is a lot of room for improvement when they go elsewhere. So when Zay Jones leaves in 2020 or 2021 or whatever, he'll be something I he'll be someone I will be keeping an eye on. Same with a few other players, but that, that's that's the takeaway I'm, I guess I'm getting at here. So I like Robert Woods a lot as an MVP, and those would probably be the three most valuable wide receivers if I had to choose based on their production and their draft capital. Now, running backs. There's about five guys on this list that we have here. Um, Todd Gurley is a clear number one. Was picked the 101 by every smart player. Obviously not named me. The one right now, he's on pace to have the best flex fantasy scoring season of all time. So I'm not really going to get into Todd Gurley, but obvious MVP candidate. Melvin Gordon is another uh, MVP candidate. He was the 10th overall player off the board. RB8 right now, he is sitting at RB2. And I went over his 16-game uh, his pace. He's obviously missed one game, but in the six games he's played, he's on pace for like 24 total touchdowns. And he just looks really, really damn good. And having these players, like he's averaging, let me see, 26.4 half-point PPR is that half point? Oh, no, that's not half point PPR. Sorry. That's that's full PPR. So 26.4 full point PPR fantasy points per game, which is wild in itself. 23.9. So on a normal day, that is on a normal season, besides these Todd Gurley seasons, that is RB1. And those are the advantages that you're going to get week over week that literally win you a league. I'm in one league, my the 12, a 12-person 12 league where Melvin Gordon was my first round pick. And I'm in like fifth place out of 12. And the only, literally, the, I mean, I draft, it's a super flex league. So I have Aaron Rodgers and Matt Ryan as my quarterback. So that's a big reason why. But Melvin Gordon is literally like probably 50% of the reason I'm even holding on to a playoff spot in that league. Had I went with someone like, you know, obviously if I went Leonard Fournette, that'd be bad. But had I went with like a, a wide receiver like Michael Thomas or like Odell Beckham Jr., I'm pretty sure I would be contending for like 10th or 11th place right now. Melvin Gordon's been super valuable. Third guy on this list, and this is not in any particular order, but just um, guys that, I don't know, just popped up in my head. But the clear, 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 a clear MVP here is James Conner, running back for the Steelers. Picked 170th overall. Obviously, if you were a Bell owner, you probably picked him a lot earlier. There was one league I drafted Bell in. I handcuffed him with James Conner. Thank God. But he was basically undrafted if you picked a little earlier. Um, he was obviously drafted late in your drafts if he was picked, if you were drafting, you know, right before the season kicked off or whatever. Right now, he is currently running back three on a points per game basis, averaging 22.8 half PPR points per game. And I want you to look at this, this chart here made by Scott Barrett of PFF. Now, Connor's coming off October where he was Offensive Player of the Month. And at the end of the day, what this chart tells you is running backs don't matter, guys. Running backs, actually, you know what? We're going to pull the chart away for a second. I want to get into this discussion because I don't, well, I'm not, not enough of you guys are on Twitter to understand these, these arguments and these conversations, I don't think. And if you're not on Twitter, you should get on Twitter and follow my ass at Nick underscore BDGE. That's a whole nother, it's a whole nother, nother thing. But guys, running backs don't matter. Running backs literally don't matter. You have to understand, when I say, like, yes, it is nice to have a good running back on your team, I mean in, in the NFL. In fantasy, running backs are, like, almost the only thing that matter. But in real life, running backs don't matter. And I say this because think about, all right, think about, like, the Vegas lines, right? If your team is, say, seven-point favorites, minus seven, going into a game, their starting running back gets hurt and will not be playing in that game. The line of that game will not change. 
Vegas does not give a shit if your running back is not playing or if they are playing. It does not affect the outcome of the game because running backs are very replaceable. For instance, if Todd Gurley got hurt tomorrow, I'm pretty confident that Malcolm Brown would produce 85 to 90% of the total yardage that he would. So running backs don't matter. Quarterbacks are ridiculously valuable in the sense that if your starting quarterback is out of the game, like if Aaron Rodgers gets hurt and he's out of the game, the point, the lot, the expected win total of your team and the, uh, the, uh, on a week over week basis, like the, the lines for those games are going to be shifted by like more than a touchdown. So that's the reason why people, yeah, Barkley is fucking amazing. Great. But your team still sucks. Like it didn't matter if you had hit it on a good quarterback, like Barkley could be the elite, the best running back of all time. And your team is still going to suck. You understand that? Like, while it's great to, to have that guy on your team, it doesn't affect your win total. However, if you had drafted a quarterback that's good, your team is going to be exponentially better. That's the reason why people are arguing against Barkley at the number two pick. And for the people that think it was a good pick at number two, this season does not prove anything. This, thing, this season, if anything, argues against your point. Because you could have literally the best player of all time at the running back position, and you clearly see it still does not affect your win total whatsoever. Yes, they'd probably be a little bit worse had Barkley not gone to their team because he makes so many plays for them. But if they had hit on a quarterback, their team would be sitting way, 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 way better than they are now. Um, and uh, I just don't think enough people understand that, you know, just the premise of how much quarterbacks affect the game versus running backs. Same thing as like cornerbacks, same thing as uh, DNs, players that can get after the pass rusher. And those are, those are the reasons why those guys are constantly picked at the top of the drafts. But as I was saying, back to the chart, this is just showing James Connors' production and almost like every statistical category in terms of just a player overall, from a fantasy standpoint, James Conner has been as valuable, if not more valuable than Le'Veon Bell in almost every season that Bell's had with the Steelers so far. So it's been a ridiculously good year for James Conner. If you have him, you've been riding him into the ground and you're almost hoping to this point that Le'Veon Bell does not come back at all this year. Um, I don't really know what the situation is. I don't even know if he's allowed to, you know, not come back at all. If he doesn't come back, then Connor's obviously going to be the workhorse going forward, and that's what you need. If Bell does come back, we don't know what the situation is going to be. Is it going to be a, a, a share, a timeshare? Because there's no way that Bell comes back, and then James Connor, the offensive player of the month, is just going to be, you know, benched. Like, I, I, you can't see that happening at this point. So, connor has been super valuable. Um, the next obvious candidate at this position is James White, running back for the Patriots. Drafted 108th overall, running back 41 off the board, currently sitting at running back seven in half PPR leagues. I'm sure that is higher in, let me look at it from a full PPR standpoint. He is running back five in full PPR. Actually running back six points per game. He's running back six. Still ridiculous. Um, it's basically an afterthought. And he was actually the eighth New England player off the board in fantasy drafts this summer. There were eight players before him. It was Brady. It was Gronk. It was two other running backs, Sonny Michelle and Rex Burkhead. There was um, Julian Edelman. There was Chris Hogan. And uh, was there another wide receiver? Oh, maybe I guess he was the seventh off the board because I was looking at the numbers and it had Josh Gordon, but obviously he wasn't a Patriot at the time. So seventh New England player off the board, third New England running back all off the board. He already has 55 receptions on the year through eight games. Last year he had 56. So one more in, in the entire season. Um, and in 2016, he set his career high in receptions with 60 throughout the entire season. So he's going to beat his career high probably in the next game against Green Bay. He's been ridiculously consistent. He's had double-digit half-point PPR points in all eight of his games so far. He's had over 14 PPR points in all eight of his games so far. He's had over um, 23 and a half PPR points in four of eight games so far. So he's not only giving you the consistency, but every other week he's giving you huge, huge numbers if you have him in a PPR league. And he has scored in six of his eight games. He has scored multiple times in two of those games. Um, so he has eight touchdowns on the year. He's on pace for 1,326 total yards and 16 touchdowns with 110 receptions. That's elite RB production on any given year in fantasy. And uh, if you picked him up off the wire, you probably didn't. He was probably drafted in your league. But if you did, obviously he was the key waiver wire pickup this year. And uh, actually, I just saw a trade went through in one of my leagues two weeks ago, or last week maybe, that was trading OBJ for James White. Straight up, half PPR. And a lot of the people in my league were like, wow, what a, what a bad trade. And I was like totally on the side with James White. And I get what OBJ brings to the table, but dude, James White has had 
four of eight games with 23 and a half fantasy points. That's like what you're hoping for. That's like also kind of like the ceiling for OBJ. You're not really going to get that many 25 to 30 point fantasy games out of him. And James White has been arguably more consistent. So I think they're pretty much even. And if you if you need running back depth or if you need a running back over wide receiver, then I, I would side with James White in the, on that side of the trade. Um, so we have Gurley, we have Gordon, we have James Conner, we have James White. The last guy I have on this list is Adrian Peterson of the Cardinals, man. Picked 112th overall, running back 42. Currently sitting at running back 12 in half-point PPR leagues. Peterson's just been a fucking animal, man. Peterson is, through seven games, he has, let me see, 700 and... 20 something total yards. So he's on pace for over 1600 total yards. He has five touchdowns. So he's on pace for around 11 or 12 touchdowns. And again, running back production this year has been absolutely nuts. I was, I was looking into some numbers and like even David Johnson is on pace for 1200 yards and uh, double digit touchdowns this year. So, I mean, as bad as he's been, relatively speaking to other running backs, he hasn't really been that bad in a vacuum. Like he's not losing you your, your league. Adrian Peterson, 1600 total yards. 10 to 12 touchdowns, someone that you just got hyped on like right before your draft because you saw him in the preseason or if you saw, you know, you saw all the injuries and you're like, oh, AP might have a chance to run away with this. He looked pretty good in the preseason. So you probably drafted him, you know, 10th, 12th, 13th, 14th round. And now he's an absolute stud for your team. Week in and week out, he's getting volume, 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 volume. Chris Thompson has been like a non-factor since the first couple weeks of the season. I know he's been in and out of line with, uh, with injuries, but like even when he's back in, he's really not getting that many snaps. So um, it will be interesting to see over the second half of the year if Chris Thompson gets more and more involved and Peterson kind of takes a back seat. But Peterson only has nine receptions on the year. So that has not been his, um, you know, that has not been the reason why he's been so productive. It's, it's, it's the volume that he's been seeing on a week over week basis. And if you look back at the carry totals, he's had 26 last week, 24 the week before that, 17. He had four the week before that, but that was because they were getting blown out by New Orleans. But 19, 11, 26. So three games of over... 24 carries, um, four game, six games of 17 carries or more. So, you know, he's just getting the volume. And when you're going to get that type of volume, you're probably going to produce as an RB2, if not an RB1. So Peterson is definitely an MVP if you drafted him late. And then looking at the tight end position, guys, I don't, like, to be honest, I don't know if there's anyone I can include on this list. I mean, there's Ertz and there's Kelsey, obviously great, but I wouldn't say they're like league winning tight ends, um, considering where they were drafted. Like you had to use like third, fourth round capital on these guys if you wanted them on your team. Um, and it's not like Ertz has been on a points per game basis. He's not that far ahead of Kelsey. The other guy, the one guy I would say, um, I mean, those two are not that far ahead of any of these guys, like Eric Ebron, Jared Cook, George Kittle on a points per game basis. I think I would put Eric Ebron in this category because he was someone you obviously picked up off the waivers once Jack Doyle got hurt. Ebron was averaging like 13 points a game when Doyle was gone, which is right around where Kelsey is averaging right now. I guess like, I, I you know what I wanted to look at? I wanted to look at like get guys, I guess, that were actually league winning guys. So I went into my five redraft leagues and I was looking at players that were owned on the, the teams that were in first place. And, you know, there's a lot of feelings. There was a lot of girlies, of course, a lot of Melvin Gordons. But Ertz was the tight end on two of the five teams, which I, I guess you could say that he was probably an MVP at, at this point. But I also think the draft capital probably tells you that, um, not that you were expecting this high of a number, but, you know, like that's kind of what you were expecting. So Ertz is averaging 14.1 fantasy points per game. Kelsey's right below him at 13.8. Um, Eric Ebron, 12.4. So like they're, they're, it's not like crazy, crazy valuable over, uh, another position or another guy at the position. So I'm hesitant to say that anyone's an MVP, but it would be Ertz, Kelsey, Ebron, and George Kittle for me at this point. So those are the four guys that I really like at tight end that have, you know, done a very good job thus far. So that'll pretty much wrap up like the MVPs that I had in mind. You guys should drop a comment down below. Who do you, who would you say I left off this list that you would consider an MVP? I'm probably gonna get a lot of Kareem Hunts and Alvin Kamara and, and those types of guys. The reason I didn't put them on this list was because one, they were, you know, all those guys, those guys were first round picks and they are not performing as well as the Melvin Gordons and the Todd Gurley's. So I can't just put every first round running back in this class. And if I'm gonna choose first round running backs, I might as well choose the, the best ones, right? So, um, I don't know if I'd choose, like, obviously Kamara and Hunt have helped you win a ton of games, and they would, like, you know, if you're just, if you're going to put a bunch of running backs into here, they would obviously be, like, the next class of MVPs, but given their draft capital and their production relative to the other guys drafted around where they were drafted, I'm not sure they make the cut. But otherwise, you know, drop some uh, other wide receivers, tight ends, or quarterbacks, or whatever that you think would be MVPs for this season. 
we're going to get into the best waiver wire pickups of the year. Before we do that, though, uh, I want to let you guys know, again, if you're following me on other social media platforms, you've probably seen me just spam the fuck out of you guys over the last couple days. But BBGE is looking to put a team together. We are officially accepting applications to bring on new content creators, video content creators. So I want some of you guys to actually start making videos. So you're doing what I'm doing, but in your own, you know, in your own way, however you want to do it, your own HQ, your own personality, your own thought process, whatever. I want to start bringing on other people to create video content since we are expanding and the brand is growing pretty quickly. Uh, I want to, you know, blow this motherfucker up. So if you think you'd be a good fit, if you think you have what it takes to give value to an audience, I would love for you to apply. Um, you know, there will be a link down below. It'll be the first link in the description. So just go through that and there will be more details and descriptions about the actual job itself. And if you still think it, uh, you'd be a good fit, obviously there will be a, a, an apply button on that on that page where you can fill out your information. Um, and if I think you're a good fit, we will go from there and go through the interview process and the next steps and whatever. Um, but come all, come any, I don't discriminate anyone that wants to apply for it, whether you are a girl, a guy, white, black, doesn't matter, I don't give a shit. The market doesn't care what you look like, neither do I. So make sure you apply. And uh, and let's move to the best waiver wire pickups. I, I, I did the top five because I didn't wanna start talking about every single waiver wire pickup because some guys have been consistently good throughout the year. Some guys have been good waiver wire pickups. Like I'm not gonna include Geo, who was a really good waiver wire pickup for two weeks, but over the course of the year, he's not that good. First one on this list, we have one quarterback and it's Mitchell Trubisky. Currently sitting at quarterback four uh, fantasy points per game. He was really bad over the first couple of weeks. That offense did not look good. And once I started kind of shifting towards Tariq Cohen over Jordan Howard in the backfield, things started kind of turning up and flipping around. I still think Trubisky is horrible at throwing the ball. I still think he makes horrible, horrible decisions and bad throws sometimes, but he gets so many yards and so much production through his legs that he is a really valuable fantasy asset right now. As I said, quarterback four in fantasy points per game. He's on pace to throw for 4,146 passing yards, 34 passing touchdowns. He is second in the NFL um, for QBs in rushing yards, and he is on pace for 677 rushing yards. Only Cam Newton is on pace to outrush Mitch. So if you picked him up and you've been streaming him, he has done very, very, very well for you. Moving over to running backs, I think the obvious one here is Philip Lindsay, of course. Running back for the Denver Broncos. Currently a top 15 fantasy running back that you got off the waiver wire probably in week one. Ain't gonna brush the shoulders off, but he was my number one waiver wire pickup in week one in my videos. Go check that shit if you want to verify it, but I'm telling you it's big facts right now. He's only playing on 40, he's only played on 40% of the Broncos snaps and he is a top 15 fantasy uh, running back, guys. He has 531 rushing yards, three rushing touchdowns, 5.7 yards per carry, has added 18 receptions on 23 targets, 136 receiving yards, and a touchdown. He is on pace for 1,334 total yards, eight touchdowns. So kind of a, a poor man's James White at this point. Philip Lindsay's really just dripping swag, to be honest with you. I think not only does he give your team production, but this man, the swag factor goes up tenfold, man. He just looks so good. He's so fun to watch. He's so quick in and out of his cuts. And with Royce Freeman banged up with his high ankle sprain, Lindsey's been able to kind of showcase what he could do as a one-man show. And he's doing it well. They're giving him goal line carries for a guy who's so small in stature. But he was a workhorse at the college level. So they know that he can handle a big workload in the NFL. So Philip Lindsay easily... Probably the top waiver wire pickup right now, depending on what we see from Marlon Mack going forward. And he is the second best waiver wire pickup on this list. And now I know, like I just said, I'm not going to do it for a couple, like I don't want to put people on this list who have just been good for a couple weeks. But I think Marlon Mack fits the category. And of course, any of the guys I, guys I named before, like if um, James Conner, James White, or Adrian Peterson were on your waiver wire or George Kittle, then obviously they were top waiver wire pickups, but they should not have been on your wire. So if you're, if those were guys you got off the wire, you probably, you probably need to step your game up, add two more people to your league, add extra roster spots to your, to your league or whatever, because those guys should not have been on the waiver wire um, to begin with. But Marlon Mack, uh, at one point or another, he was definitely available on your waiver wire. He was probably drafted, but he was probably dropped. And he has absolutely dominated over the last three weeks, over 400, uh, over 400 total yards and four touchdowns over those last three weeks. He has been fantasy's running back three in that span as well. I mean, the matchups could not have been better for him in terms of like game script and in terms of just bad defenses. So I'm very intrigued to see what happens going forward. But in this offense that's rolling, um, that's averaging like 
a ton of points, a ton of production. They're looking really good. Solid offensive line, really solid play calling. Um, I, I think Mac has, at worst, he's probably going to be a high-end RB2 for the rest of the season who's going to get a lot of volume. And he's not, he hasn't been playing all the snaps in that offense yet, so he might get more and more work going forward. Um, so he has potential to really, really bust out. And he would be my third best, or, you know, just third on this list. Again, this isn't in, in, in order. Um, but Marlon Mack, great waiver I pick up. If you got him, I actually picked him up, flipped him and Keenan Allen for Travis Kelsey. We'll have to see if that's a good move or not. I, I could be regretting that in a couple of weeks. But next on this list is Tyler Boyd, wide receiver for the Cincinnati Bengals. He was definitely not drafted in your league. So far, he is wide receiver 10 in fantasy football. 49 receptions, 620 yards, 5 touchdowns. So he is on pace for about 100 catches. 1,250 yards and 10 touchdowns. It's just a monster, monster season um, for the Cincinnati Bengals slot receiver, man. Since that injury happened to uh, A.J. Green in week one, or in week two, Tyler Boyd really took over. He's had games of 691 in a touchdown, 6 for 132 in a touchdown, uh, 11 catches for 100 yards, 7 for 62 and 2 touchdowns. Last week, 9 for 138 in a touchdown. So in more than half his games, 5 out of 8 of his games have been absolutely monster games this year so if you got him you have pretty much a wide receiver two on your team um however I, I would say he's i don't know if he's necessarily a must start every single week unless the matchup is there because a lot of the games he's done it in um outside of the baltimore game which he exploded in week two but that was also baltimore was very banged up they were hurting at, at the d-back position at that point they had jimmy smith on suspension um, what's his name? Mosley went out of the game, hurt in the beginning of the game. AJ Green got hurt, and that's probably why Boyd had such a big game. But his other games came against Atlanta, Miami, Tampa Bay, uh, Pittsburgh, and Carolina. So none of those are good pass defenses. Um, so I would say he may struggle against better pass defenses, but they just haven't seen a lot of those pass defenses yet. So if it is a tough matchup, I would probably downgrade him a little bit. But either way, he's been killing it for you in good matchups. So he would be the fourth guy on this list. The fifth guy on this list is Eric Ebron. I talked about him in my MVP uh, award. So he's currently tight in three on the year. He was an absolute stud while Jack Doyle was gone. So if you picked him up off the wire, uh, wire and tried to stream him, he obviously did wonders for you. And the crazy part about it is, is while Doyle has been in the lineup, there's been three games while Doyle has played, right? Weeks one, two, and this previous week, week eight, Ebron has played on 45, 26, and 22% of the team snaps. But he's averaging, right? And so he hasn't played in a lot of the snaps. So when Doyle's on the field, Ebron is not seeing the field much. But he's averaging 11 and a half fantasy points per game in those three games. And he has scored a touchdown in all three of the games. Um, in the five weeks without Doyle, he's averaging 13 fantasy points per game, which is just 0.8 fantasy points per game fewer than Kelsey. And that includes a, a week five at New England, where it was basically a week winning uh, week for you from Ebron, where he had over like 27 fantasy points. So Ebron was an absolute stud in those games. Now, I'm not saying he loses his value with Doyle back, but he's kind of limited to just a red zone role. Um, and, you know, we've obviously seen that Luck likes to throw the tight ends in the, in the red zone, and he's a touchdown scorer. So he'll, he'll be useful, but he's more of a back end tight end one going forward. And uh, actually, I wanted to put one more MVP, one more top waiver wire pickup, one more GOAT on this list. And that is the defensive position. Ugh! And it's the streaming goddamn defenses position. That's that's who the fucking GOAT is this year for defenses. It's streaming the goddamn defenses. I went back and looked at all the defenses that I've streamed for the past eight weeks in my E-Town Get Down League, all owned under 55%. Their points add up to Fantasy defense won, and it's not even close on a points per game basis. Streaming defenses is the way to go. The reason a lot of people took the fucking Jaguars in like round eight, round nine, round 10 this year, thinking they were cute, thinking they were smart. And I want you to look at this tweet, this, this tweet thread that I put out yesterday. So I went back basically, and what I did was I looked at the ADP, right? So I looked at which defenses were the top ones drafted, and I looked at where they currently rank right now. So the first tweet, is the current top scoring fantasy defenses and their ADP, so where they were drafted. The Bears are the number one fantasy defense. They were drafted 13th. The Bengals are second. They were outside of the top 22. My data doesn't have the ADP of the defenses outside of the top 22, so Bengals were undrafted. The Steelers were ninth overall. The Chiefs were 19th overall, and the Browns were undrafted as well. Those are the top five defenses. And the second tweet is the top five defenses in terms of where they were drafted and then their current ranking. So you have the Jaguars, who were uh, the top defense drafted. Like I said, they were drafted very early in some leagues. 
They're currently defense number 24. The Rams are seventh overall. The Vikings are 12th. The Eagles are 27th. The Chargers are 18th. Those are the top five guys. None of them are within the top five rankings this year. Only one of them are top 10. This is the same shit that happens every year. And I tweeted this tweet out in the summer prior to this year's, and I did it for last year, and I did it for the year before, and it's the same thing, guys. Drafting a defense, it, it's never the same thing year over year. This, the top five defenses are almost never in the top five defenses in the following year. There's no reason to try to get smart and cute and pick ahead. I'm telling you, it almost never works. Do not get cute when it comes to defenses, people. Let's move into the LVPs, or the WOTs, or the anti-GOATs, whatever, whatever you prefer to call them. We're gonna look at the guys that have absolutely murdered your team. Before we do that though, gotta say thank you to today's sponsor for the video. Yo no, who would you? What are you? What are you? What are you? Fantasyjocks.com. Also wanna give a shout out to Jared Goff. I wanna give a shout out to Odell Beckham for having the two goat Halloween costumes. OBJ was Mike Epps from uh, from How High, that baby blue pimp outfit. Pimpin' since pimp, pimpin' since pimp, pimp. That's a goat movie, by the way. If you've never seen How High with Red Man and Method Man, do yourself a fucking favor and grow up and watch that shit. And Jared Goff was uh, was Jamie Kennedy from Malibu's Most Wanted. Fucking pulled that costume off fantastically. Both guys killed it on Halloween. Here are your, your best Halloween costumes, actually. I want to I wanna see comments down below. Sometimes uh, I steal some of y'all ideas for next year's Halloween. I start, you know what I do? Because every time Halloween fucking comes around, I'm like, ah, shit. It's like three days before Halloween. I'm like, ah, I don't have a costume. But like this year, I started in one of my notepads, right? In my notepad in my book and in my phone. Like throughout the year, when I think of a good costume idea, I just write it down in there and then I'll have one that just has like Halloween on it and I'll look back on it in October and I'll have like seven good ideas to go off of. So I want you all to drop a comment down below if you have good Halloween costume ideas for me that I could steal because I'm gonna write them down below. Oh, fantasyjocks.com. Yes, the industry leader in fantasy league gear. Belts, ringlings, trophies, draft boards, miscellaneous. They got some swag on their, on their website. They've got some some funny phrases on, on coffee mugs and t-shirts and things like that. They got a whole shitload of different packages and products and, and stuff on there. So highly recommend you check out fantasyjocks.com for your fantasy football league. The playoffs are coming up, man, and you wanna play for something, whether it's a belt or trophy, and the league winner can get the name, the team names engraved on here. You can get custom belts that have your league's uh, name on here. We got the E-Town Get Down League uh, custom belt, but unfortunately the winner has that. I don't have that right now, although I'm trying to take that shit back. Take a bike to the HQ this year. Check out fantasyjocks.com. Use promo code TAKE10 or TACO CORP for 10% off your purchase. Have everyone chip in five, eight, 10 bucks, and you'll be able to get yourself some perfect hardware for the year. Thank you, Fantasy Jocks, for sponsoring today's video. Also, if you want any exclusive content from your boy, from your mans, Patreon.com slash BDGE is the place to go where we are answering all of your sit star questions, your trade questions. We have a weekly private live stream that Patreons only can access. I do my weekly rankings on there. So if you're looking for a little bit extra of an edge in your fantasy league, hoping to take on the chip, check out Patreon.com slash BDGE, become a subscriber, and I will love you forever. But let's move on to the LVPs, the votes. Now, I split this up into three categories, basically. I... Put one category for the votes due to injuries. I did a second category for the LVP. They're just doing woat things. Like they just are trash this year. Third is extra medium votes. Like they're not full. You're not fully woat. You're not a full woat, but you're still pissing me the fuck off. You know what I mean? Like you drafted him thinking he was going to do good and you're doing a lot of woat. You have a lot of woat like characteristics. You know what I mean? Like you're not going full woat, you know? Like Johnny Drama said, you never go full, you never go, actually, I'm going to leave that out of here because it's 2018 and everyone takes offense to everything anything's ever said. So I'm going to leave that out of here, but you get the point. So due to injuries this year, the Wotes, Leonard Fournette, Dalvin Cook, Devonta Freeman, all top two round picks um, have combined to miss basically the entire season. Freeman's on the IR. Leonard Fournette has missed basically the entire season with a fucking hamstring pull. He's going to be back after the bye, hopefully. Dalvin Cook has missed most of the season with a hamstring injury as well. So those guys are guys you invested heavy capital into and have just not panned out. Jay Jai is the other guy. He wasn't like that good to begin with. He has that that big week one game where, of course, I played him in like three, three of my leagues and then he hasn't done shit since. I think that was just the way the fantasy gods planned it out just to fuck me over and then get him out of the, the rest of the season. But he's on the IR now too. So he's kind of in between that category of injury woke and half woke. So Jay Jai is one of those guys. Evan Ingram um, was, 
I think like tight end five drafted, you probably use the top six, maybe five ish round pick on him and he's been injured for most of the year and then there's Jarek McKinnon which you should not have drafted anyways but a lot of people went against it these preseason injuries guys that's one thing to take away from my channel if there are like a few themes to my channel that I want you to learn from this year it's the preseason injuries are something to be way more pessimistic than optimistic about as soon as he messed up his calf in the preseason that should have been a huge trigger to you that you should not draft him anywhere near his draft capital same thing with Doug Baldwin those guys are guys that have probably killed your team due to injuries. Now, we're gonna go full woat here. Full woat Le'Veon Bell. If you drafted like a week before the season kicked off, you took him in the top three most likely. He has not played. If you didn't grab, if you didn't grab James Conner, you have been without your first round pick for the entire season, which sucks. So he fucked you bad. Um, next up is Derrick Henry. Trash, trash. This guy, he's just not good at football. I don't care what you say. If you watch him run, he is just horrible. He's a big body that just runs upright, and unless it's literally an open hole with one guy to try to run over, he's not doing shit. Derrick Henry sucks. I still, I, I don't know what to make of Chris Hogan. Like, I, looking back on the analysis, I can't even say, like, where it was that I went wrong. If anyone has an idea of why Chris Hogan was not a good pick, please let me know, man. Please let me know why Chris Hogan was an easy fade. Like, I just, I felt like the volume was going to be there. I know it's like the Patriots, and that's why, right? But, like, I love Sonny Michel, and he's been a stud in the games that he's played, as long as he wasn't injured. And uh, the argument against him was like, oh, it's the Patriots. And uh, I don't know, dude. Chris Hogan just broke my heart. And I feel, I feel like that's just a guy I need to just cross off the list and then pretend I never did an analysis on him and then just keep moving forward. But Chris Hogan, if you use the fourth or fifth round pick on him, obviously you have not been able to use him. The, the, two, the game that you probably used him in was week one and he did absolutely nothing for you. So Chris Hogan, Amari Cooper. Um, Amari Cooper, I was debating putting him on the extra medium votes because he's had some big games, but for the most part, it's been hard to tell when he was going to have them. So you also probably used a third, fourth, fifth round pick on Amari Cooper. Been trash this year. Demarius Thomas, trash. Royce Freeman, trash. I didn't, oh, fuck man. It pissed me off because I didn't even really like Freeman. And I remember I drafted him in two leagues. One of them was because you guys, I remember I was live streaming the, the draft in NYC. It was a live draft that I had. And I was debating between Royce Freeman and Lamar Miller. And you guys told me to go Royce Freeman. So I went with Royce Freeman. I can't, you know, I can't blame y'all because I was the one who fucking picked them. I'm, a, I'm the drafter. I ended up flipping Freeman for Lamar Miller right before the season kicked off, thank God. But Freeman's been trash. Uh, Lindsey's been the far and away better back in that backfield. So if you use a, an early round pick on Freeman, you'd probably have dropped him by this point. Allen Robinson, trash, can't stay healthy. Josh Gordon, it's the fucking Easter Bunny at this point. It's all this hypothetical theory and upside that just has not panned out. Corey Davis, another guy who has not been able to stay healthy. And this, actually, he's been pretty healthy for the most part. But the Tennessee Titans offense is just trash. Shad Penny, trash. Jamal Williams, trash. That's a big L for me because I had Jamal Williams in like three of my five leagues. Um, you know, you didn't have to go heavy draft capital on him. I probably got him in like the eighth, ninth round in most of my leagues, but he was horrible the first two weeks and now he's probably going to be phased out for the most part. Uh, not phased out, but Aaron Jones is going to take over this backfield. So those guys have been LVPs. Uh, extra medium wotes. Not full wotes, but guys pissing me the fuck off, like I said. Um, and I'm not going to put David Johnson in this category. Because, like I said, he's not really someone who's killed your season. Um, he's had usable weeks for the most part. But he's just like an RB2 as opposed to the high-end RB1 you expected. So I guess he could go in this category. The other one is Keenan Allen, um, who I drafted. I had David Johnson and Keenan Allen on a lot of my leagues. And surprisingly, like, I'm doing fine in... Actually, no. Well, in the E-Town Get Down League, that, those are my first two picks. I'm in second place with the second most points. In the NYC League, those are my first two picks. And I'm in... I'm in eighth place, but I have like the third most points in the league. So it was just fucking unlucky. And uh, the third league, I'm doing fucking horrible. And it was my friends from college. I'm the defending champ in that league and I'm doing miserable. So that was not a good one. But Keenan Allen is a guy who has been very mediocre up to this point. Um, and I know everyone's like super high on him blowing up over the second half of the season. However, there's literally no analysis behind that prediction other than the fact that he did it last year. So I'm not on board with that. Um, Gronkowski... And Jordan Howard were both two, three round picks that have not panned out well. Um, Gronk has been kind of miserable this year. He hasn't been able to stay on the field. And he hasn't been amazing when he has been on the field. Jordan Howard is just not getting it done. Does not look good in that offense. So he has been pretty bad. Um, and then I put Marvin Jones on this list. But I don't know if you'd really categorize him to be there. Because it's not like you had to pick him before the sixth 
ish round. So he's been all, he's been okay, and I do expect a lot better things out of him the second half of the year because of Golden Tate's departure, which opens up like 27% of the targets in that offense. But he hasn't been that great. People got high on him because he was the wide receiver seven last year. However, I, I talked about this in my last video production he put up last year. Those wide receiver seven numbers would only have been wide receiver 23 right now in, in this year. Uh, Marvin Jones is definitely someone who has not been great for your team. It's hard to start him on a week over week basis. Those are the LVPs. Those are the WOTs. Those are the anti-GOATs. If you have any other guys that you want to put on that list, let me know. Drop a comment down below, guys, that you absolutely hate this year. I know it's probably going to be some maybe like Alex Collinses and some dudes like that, but drop a comment down below. Let me know who else you would include on those lists, and I want you to define which list they would be on. While you're down there, hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel if you are new, and we're going to dive into second half of season predictions. Now, I didn't go crazy into this one. Actually, there's a decent amount of analysis on these bad boys, so we're going to look at just, just second half MVPs, or guys that I expect to have a really, 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 really good second half of the year, pretty much based on their second half of the year schedule. And... I'm going to leave out the obvious ones. Like, I'm not going to tell you Patrick Mahomes, Aaron Rodgers, Adam Thielen, Todd Gurley, those type of guys. I'm going to go maybe, maybe, maybe a little bit more under the radar. First guy on this list is Cam Newton of the Carolina Panthers. His last three games, his fantasy point totals have been 23, 26, 28. Better and better and better each week. He is starting to absolutely heat up. He has Greg Olson back in the lineup who has looked pretty good. He has DJ Moore, their impressive, talented first-round rookie who is getting more and more involved. Um, and those... Last three games were at Washington, at Philadelphia, and versus Baltimore. Those Neither of those three games are easy games to produce high-level fantasy production, and he's done that. The big takeaway here is this. His rest-of-season schedule. Home against Tampa Bay, at Pittsburgh, at Detroit, Seattle, at Tampa Bay, at Cleveland, New Orleans, Atlanta. That playoff schedule is juicy as a mother frig. He gets Tampa Bay twice before the playoffs, Detroit, Pittsburgh, Good Lord. His rest of the season schedule is absurd. Shout out to Lucas in the, when my subscriber leagues, we, you know, we have the lead together, of course, but we have a group me chat. So, or it's like a WhatsApp for, for you guys that are familiar with that. We get together in a group me chat and that's how we communicate throughout the season. And he actually got these numbers. This is from him, not from me. So shout out Lucas. He posted this picture and these are Cam Newton's numbers through eight games in his 2015 MVP season versus his numbers right now through eight games. His statistics are actually far, far better now than his MVP season. Obviously he took off and the second half of the season was ridiculous for Cam Newton in that MVP season, but he is still completing 12% more of his passes. He has 120 more passing yards, two more touchdowns, four less interceptions, um, more rushing yards. So that I just thought that was kind of crazy and I wanted to include that. So Cam Newton's second half of the season schedule is really, really, really ridiculous. Moving on to the wide receiver I wanted to add on this list is John Brown, wide receiver of the Baltimore Ravens. Now, you've seen me kind of throw his name into the mix in a lot of these videos, and this is why. When you look at his second half of the season schedule, man, it is absolutely prime time filet mignon juice. No one in the bottom half of the league in terms of fantasy points allowed to wide receivers. Week 9, he gets Pittsburgh at home. In their first matchup, he went three for 116 and a touchdown. He gets their bye, then he gets Cincinnati, giving up the fourth most points to wide receivers. Oakland, Atlanta, Kansas City, Tampa Bay, LA Chargers. Dude, that Tampa Bay Week 15 matchup might literally win people their first round of their playoffs. And it's not just the fantasy points, just as a defense overall, their pass defenses, um, when you look at it from Football Outsiders, pass defense, DVOA, all of them struggle pretty bad. Kansas City, I will say, has been low-key actually very good against the pass. And per Evan Silva, they still have not allowed a touchdown pass to a wide receiver since week two. So Kansas City has been low-key a very good pass defense against wide receivers. But John Brown's rest of the season schedule, for the most part, is going to be absolutely bonkers for you. So I like Cam Newton. I like John Brown to explore over the second half of the year. And then running backs, I didn't really like dive into anyone in particular, but there are a few guys, and it's mostly the young running backs that I really like on this list. And it is Karrion Johnson, Aaron Jones, Dalvin Cook, Sonny Michelle, and Deion Lewis. These guys I like to have very, very big second half of the year outbreaks. Karrion Johnson, um, obviously we've seen the upside from him. I think uh, it's going to be tough for him to actually break out in the second half of the year. And I, I'm not sure I trust the coaches to do the right thing there. But we do have Theo Riddick coming back. And LeGarrette Blount is still you know, in the mix for goal line carries. 
and he does have a very tough second half of the season schedule, but I think he's just a stud outright. And if they give him the volume, he's, he's going to be a huge factor in fantasy going forward. So I would say he has a very high floor, but his ceiling might be tough to hit. Um, but if, if, if they do, you know, do the right thing there in Detroit and give him the carries, carry on is going to have a monster second half of the season. Aaron Jones is the next guy on this list with Ty Montgomery out of Green Bay, right? He got moved to the Ravens before the trade deadline. This opens up the backfield. It's literally just Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams there. Now we saw Aaron Jones kind of take over the, um, the backfield last game and, and see the majority of touches and he should get a lot more carries and a lot more targets moving forward this offense is also starting to pick up right they're averaging 28 points per game over their last three games and the reason he wasn't used that much over the first half of the season was because they were trailing a lot and Aaron Rodgers had to you know he was in comeback mode for a lot of the the time and I think the Packers see Aaron Jones as the third option as in terms of like a third down back in terms of receiving and pass blocking here. Now you take time out of that equation and it's just Jamal Williams and it's just Aaron Jones. And I think this offense getting better and hopefully this defense getting a little stronger off their body. You would think the game script would be more favorable to Aaron Jones going forward. And you look at their schedule uh, going forward. The only matchup that worries me in terms of game script is I think week 12 when they're at Minnesota. All the other games should be winnable if not very good game scripts for them. So I think uh, the outlook for Aaron Jones just being in a two-man backfield now kind of guarantees him like 12 to 15 touches a game going forward. And, you know, if you see them starting to get hot and them winning and the game scripts being really in favor of Jones and him improve in the passing uh, passing work, he could be a monster down the stretch for you. So I like Jones to break out. Dalvin Cook is a guy who's um, just been bit with the injury injury bug, right? He's a second round pick. So I, I expect him to perform like a second round pick when he does finally return to the lineup, which should be after their week. 10 by, I think it it, it is. Um, Latavius Murray has been a stud since Dalvin Cook has left, at least over the last few weeks. He was horrible in a couple of the games. Then all of a sudden he kind of broke out. So with Murray doing so well, I'd expect Cook to put up similar numbers, if not better numbers. And you look at his playoff matchups, man, he gets Miami in week 15, who have allowed the third most fantasy points to running backs, and Detroit in week 16, six most fantasy points to running backs. So if Cook is healthy, healthy I think he will get the very big lion share of the workload. I don't think Latavius Murray is going to see 50% of the touches or anything like that if you're worried about it. So I love Cook over the second half of the year. Sonny Michel went healthy. We saw him um, average nearly 21 touches a game for the Patriots in those games where he was, you know, he played the full game. He scored four times in those four games. He will be uh, a stud when healthy and the Patriots will ride him into the playoffs um, down the stretch. So, you know, when he's healthy, I think he is a low-end RB1 for the rest of the season. So those guys I love. And uh, I love Deion Lewis, man. I love him, man. When you look at this backfield, the team has been producing at such a low level that it's kind of uh, come back on Deion Lewis and it made him look like a terrible fantasy back. However, over the last four weeks, he is getting 67% of the snaps in that backfield. Derrick Henry, just 34%. He's also averaging nearly 15 touches a game over the entire season. He's caught at least three passes in five of seven games, and he's caught five or more passes in three of seven games. So, Believe it or not, he is still on pace for a lot, uh, around 1,100 total yards and over 66 receptions. So coming into the year, if you knew that, 1,100 yards and 66 receptions, you'd be like, yeah, shit, he's like a you know, a mid to high-end RB2. Again, it's relative to the other running backs that are scoring at a ridiculously historic pace, but the problem is he only has one touchdown on the year. He has just one single target inside the red zone. He does have two goal line, uh, two goal line carries. Derrick Henry has one, so he's actually out-carried him on the goal line. He's just not seeing a lot of volume in the red zone. I think the entire offense is kind of seeing a dip in volume in the red zone. And I'm not saying you can expect second-half regression, but it's definitely or positive regression, you know what I mean? Um, or positive resurgence. That's what I'm going to say from now on. Instead of using positive regression, because I know a lot of people hate that in fantasy football, positive resurgence is what I'm going to use for, from now on instead of regression. So I'm not saying you can expect it, but I would side on... I would err towards the side of, of we, us seeing a little bit more positive resurgence in terms of volume in the red zone, which is obviously going to be good for Lewis. Because like I said, that one touchdown is what's killing him. And you look over the next three matchups, Dallas, New England, Indianapolis. All three of them rank in the top five in terms of receptions allowed to opposing running backs. So I see Lewis has a really good sneaky start this week against Dallas. He should uh, you know, catch three, five, seven passes over the next three games in a row. So I like Lewis to really start heating up here. And then for tight ends, man, I like Doyle, I like Vance McDonald, I like O.J. Howard over the second half of the season outside of the very obvious ones in Kelsey and Ertz. However, O.J. Howard and Jack Doyle have really tough rest of the season schedules for tight ends. McDonald, though, gets Baltimore this week, 
who have been really shit against tight ends, especially as of recently. So I'm not worried about that matchup. Then he gets Carolina, who've allowed the most fantasy points to the tight end position. He gets a tough stretch of Jacksonville, Denver Chargers after that. But I don't really think it's as tough as, as I initially expected because last year, Vance McDonald, you know, he played Jacksonville in the playoffs, went 10 for 112 against them. Denver's actually not that good against a tight end at all. Um, and they've been pretty bad against them all year. The Chargers are probably their only tough matchup, is only his only tough matchup going forward. But then in week 14 and 15, which is the first week of the playoffs, of course, he gets Oakland in week 14, and then he gets New England in week 15, um, who have allowed the six most fantasy points to the tight end position. So he's got a pretty easy rest of the season schedule for a fantasy tight end. So McDonald's is probably one of the guys who I expect to have a much better second half of the year going forward. So that kind of wraps up the episode, I guess. And I, again, I want to hear your guys' thoughts. Like, who did I leave off this list in terms of MVPs, top waiver wire pickups, fucking votes on this list, second half of the season pr uh, predictions, who you think is going to break out, who you think is going to um, continue the streak, or who do you think is going to, I didn't cover this, but who do you think is going to bust over the second half of the year that has been doing very well so far? Um, drop a comment down below. Let me know what you think. If you enjoyed, a thumbs up is always very, 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 very much appreciated. If you're on the podcast, a rating and review is also appreciated. It lets me know that you appreciate my content. Thus, I will keep making it and keep making more of it. Keep making more quality content. If you want to make quality content, make sure you apply for a content creator position with Big Dogs. Link in the description. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. And I'll see y'all tomorrow for Sunday's weekly live stream. Peace.